Hello and welcome. Let's talk uh, the first chapter. Uh, first chapter is going to basically take us into what we refer to as the scope of human anatomy. Now here, when we go through and we talk, for subtitles, I guess. Okay. So, welcome to the most fascinating subject there is. The uh, subject here is anatomy. Uh, we're going to learn about uh, our bodies. Now here, we'll start with chapter one. Chapter one takes us into the human body and basically gives us a, an orientation into the scope of the human uh, anatomy. And basically, we'll go through and we'll talk about the body plan, the language, and some clinical applications there. So the study of human anatomy is what we've got here first. Now, here we've got a nice picture here. This is a, a, a colorized x-ray by Leonardo da Vinci. And here we can appreciate some uh, images, basically two illustrations of uh, the skeletal system made about 500 years apart. The first one here we could see image A uh, is from an 11th century uh, work attributed to Persian physician Avicenna. I'm not uh, sure if I'm pronouncing that name correct. And uh, the second image we see here is from 15, about 1543, and that's by um, uh, Andreas uh, Vesa uh, Vesalius. Again, I'm not 100% sure with the pronunciation there. But these images here are, again, depicting to us, as we said, the skeletal system. Now, when we go through and we talk about anatomy, again, like I said, this is the most fascinating subject possible. I believe it's your own body. So here when we go through and we talk about anatomy, here we can appreciate an instructor uh, who's going through and uh, basically teaching his students. And here you can see they've got uh, a few cadavers and they've also got a skeleton here and they're able to go through and study uh, basically from uh, these various sources. So first here, let's start by, by talking about uh, how we can study anatomy. Uh, when we go through and we talk about anatomy, you can study anatomy from an atlas, yet as beautiful, fascinating, and valuable uh, atlases are, they teach nothing but locations, shapes, and names of things. Now in this class, we'll deal with functional morphology, not just the structure, but also the functional reasons behind it too. So when we go through, we talk anatomy, anatomy is going to be the study of the structure. It's a study of the structure of our body parts and their relationship to one another. To simplify, we can say it's a study of the structural basis of body function. Now, our body's structures, they can be seen they can be felt, they also can be examined. Anatomy is a broad field with many subdivisions, many subdisciplines that also study the human structure, but from a different perspective, from a different perspective. And then here we can see we have the definition of physiology, when we talk physiology, physiology is a study of the functional relevance of a structure. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we progress. So when we talk functional morphology, so we're going to go through, we're going to look at the functional reasons behind the structure there. Basically, we'll go through and we'll look at uh, the anatomy and then a little bit of physiology there as well. So when we talk uh, anatomy, it's a study of the structure. So study of the structure. So we said here we can have many subdisciplines, subdivisions. Now the subdivisions are going to include, we can see here, number one, we've got what we call gross anatomy. Gross anatomy, which is also known as macroscopic anatomy. Macroscopic anatomy. And then we talk gross anatomy or macroscopic anatomy. You'll see it's the study of body structures visible to the naked eye visible to the naked eye. So it's like uh, basically going and studying the heart and studying the heart. And when you study the heart, you study the heart by looking at the heart from a view where you've got something that looks similar to this. And you can see it gets divided up. And then here you've got the right side, the left side, right? And we look at the heart from a gross perspective, a macroscopic perspective. 
And if we talk about the lungs, then it's basically talking about uh, us looking at the lungs, when the lungs are going to be found in a shape that's kind of similar to this. And then if we're talking right or left, you know, we're going uh, to have a certain fissure there. So looking at basically, again, the lung without any aid to the eye. And if we talk kidney, looking at the kidneys and basically appreciating the kidneys and how they look, kidney being shaped, and then here we're going to see we're going to have the ureter, arteries and veins coming in, and so forth. It looks more like a mango than a kidney. Um, but I'm not an artist. I'm a medical doctor, right? <laughs> so here now when we go through and we talk about um, gross anatomy, gross anatomy uses methods such as surface observation, such as surface observation, dissections, x-rays, MRIs, right, CAT scans, we've got all these other uh, methods of studying the body that we could use there. Now the term anatomy, the term anatomy relates most closely to gross anatomy because in these studies, here we'll use preserved specimens and their organs are going to be dissected to be examined. Now when we talk gross anatomy, gross anatomy is approached in a few different ways. Number one, we can study gross anatomy regionally, region by region. So here if we say regionally, now we'll study all the structures. Now when I say all the structures, we're talking muscles, we're talking bones, we're talking blood vessels, we're talking nerves, and etc. We'll be studying all the structures at the same time, okay, so studying all these different structures I've just mentioned there at the same time, so looking at multiple, multi-organ systems, okay, at once in a given or particular region of the body, so that's why regional, so looking at all the various components, all the various organs inside of a specific region such as the abdominal region, thoracic region, okay? Next then we have what we call systemic anatomy. Systemic anatomy. Now, systemic anatomy is basically where body structures are studied system by system. For example, cardiovascular system, you would examine the heart and the blood vessels, right, of the entire body. And then third, we have what we call surface anatomy, surface anatomy. Now, surface anatomy is basically, you can think of the study of the configuration of the surface of the body. The study of the internal structures as they relate to the overlying skin surface. Surface anatomy is sometimes used to identify muscles, or locate veins in certain individuals, especially individuals that work out, go to the gym. It's also going to be very important when conducting a physical exam on a patient. Second major subdivision we'll see here is going to be microscopic anatomy now. Now when we talk microscopic anatomy, microscopic anatomy, it deals with structures that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. Here, we'll see thin slices of body tissues are stained, and they're going to be placed on slides to be examined by microscopes. Now, there's some subdivisions here as well, and the subdivisions here will include, as we can see, cytology number one. Now we talk cytology. Cytology is a study of the cells of the body. And second is histology. Histology is the study of tissues. It's a study of tissues. And then third we have developmental anatomy. Developmental anatomy. Now developmental anatomy is going to trace 
the structural changes that take place in the body throughout the lifespan. Now here we have certain subdivisions. One subdivision is embryology, for example. Embryology is a subdivision of developmental anatomy that's going to be concerned with developmental changes that occur before birth. So we said then physiology we mentioned there as well. Right, we talked about the definition of physiology there. Studies the function of the body, how the body parts are going to work and carry out their life-sustaining activities. Now here when we go through, we talk anatomical sciences. Again, we mentioned gross anatomy, surface anatomy, radiological anatomy. Now that's going to include various types of uh, methods of study, basically there. Systemic anatomy we mentioned, regional anatomy. Right? We went through histology there as well. So make sure you read the chapter and understand each of these uh, different examples uh, very well also. Now, some other methods of study are going to include inspection. We will inspect the patient's body, looking at the surface appearances, make sure there from with our eyes from head to toe, whatever we see, whatever we find that might not be uh, there normally or just might be a certain finding, we will list that there as well as, uh, as, a, as a finding in our inspection. Palpation, using our hands, feeling a structure, okay, auscultation, Right? You guys will use these different tools in uh, physiology, listening to then normal sounds throughout the body. We'll listen to heart sounds, we'll listen to lung sounds. Percussing, right? Percussion, tapping, and listening. Does it sound hollow? Does it sound like it's got fluid in here now? Where it should be hollow. And then dissection, cutting and separating of tissues, and basically by the use of cadavers. Before the 1800s, we refer to this as uh, anatomizing. And I mean, people have been fascinated with the body for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, the most uh, earliest uh, uh, known dissections and uh, basically illustrations of the body go back to, um, you know, uh, before Christ existed as well. So here when we go through, in the book, they actually go through and they mention to you the different uh, scientists there. Uh, such as uh, 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 Aristotle, uh, you've got uh, Galen, and then um, we've got uh, this Persian physician there, Avicenna, as I mentioned there as well. So these scientists were basically um, writing uh, in Greek, uh, basically philosophy books and other basically philosophy books there as well, and um, you know talking about the human body. So it's been a quite uh, fa it's been a big fascination by uh, quite uh, a few members of. Uh, uh, you know, the world uh, as we know it. Now here we can see an overview. Now to study anatomy, first of all, you've got to master anatomical terminology. That's going to be very important. And then also through observation, as we mentioned, manipulation, right, palpation, and then auscultation there as well. Physiology we mentioned there also. And then we talk anatomy and physiology, they're basically inseparable, right? Function is always going to reflect the structure, right? What a structure can do depends on its specific form, right? Uh, this uh, elbow can only basically display this hinge joint, right? We don't say here we have uh, a joint that's like the shoulder. So it's completely different. The anatomy, the structure is totally different. The structure is totally different. So the structure is going to dictate the function. Now when we go through, we talk about principles of complementarity here as well. Uh, we can see, we'll go through and we'll check uh, that out in a few seconds. And let's go through basically these different uh, organs and organ systems here. So here now we can go through and we can talk about the hierarchy. Now we talk about the hierarchy, basically the level of structural organization. Here it goes through and basically tells us that the body is going to have many levels of structural organization. And here we'll see it'll start at the most basic level, which is known as the chemical level. 
Now, when we talk chemical level, here we could see at the level of basically the chemical level, this is the simplest level of the structural hierarchy. Here we can see atoms, which are tiny building blocks of matter, are going to come together. They'll combine. And when they combine, they're going to form molecules. They'll form molecules such as water molecules, protein molecules, DNA molecules, right? various types of molecules. Then we'll move from this chemical level to the, mole uh, to the cellular level. Now, from this mole uh, moving from this chemical level to this cellular level, now basically what happens is these various molecules that we had, now they start coming together. And when they start coming together, they give rise to various organelles. Now, these organelles, we can see here at this cellular level. Now, at basically all cells we'll see now are going to have some common functions. However, individual cells will vary not only by size, also in shape, and also by function. So here we can see a few organelles coming together, and they giving rise to this one cell we see here, which is a smooth muscle cell. Now, again, we can have other types of cells being formed there as well. Now, we'll move then from this cellular level up over to the tissue level. Now, when we talk tissue level, tissues, I'd like you to know, are groups of similar cells that have a common function. The four basic tissue types in the human body now we'll go through and we'll check out as well. So here we can see what happened is a whole bunch of smooth muscle cells came together and when all these smooth muscle cells came together they gave rise to smooth muscle tissue. So again we talk about tissue. Tissue it consists of similar types of cells as we mentioned. Now we said the four basic tissue types in the human body are going to include number one we've got epithelial tissue we can see here epithelial tissue it's a type of tissue that's found covering body surfaces and lining the, all of our cavities connective tissue second type of tissue connective tissue is a tissue that supports and protects our organs next then we have muscle tissue muscle tissue is going to provide us with movement and then fourth type of tissue found in the body is nervous tissue nervous tissue provides a means of rapid internal communication by transmitting electrical impulses so now here we could move to the organ level now when we talk organ level here I want you to know an organ is going to be a discrete structure that is composed of at least two primary tissue types. Four is more common that perform a specific function for the body. We can see here, number one, this blood vessel. The blood vessel now has all four primary tissue types nervous tissue okay will be able to regulate constriction or dilation in relation to the vessel so we've got four tissue types so that's an organ right on our driver's license we like to put organ donors right but we have to make sure we know what we're donating before we are starting to donate these things so we're donating organs organs are structures made up of two or more primary tissue types more commonly all four primary tissue types the stomach, for example, right, lining tissue, epithelial, providing support to that, epithelia, connective, muscle tissue within the walls, and then when you have a stomach ache, you feel that stomach ache, so nervous tissue. Liver, okay, all examples of, epi uh, all examples of organs. So organ level is where extremely complex functions become possible. For example, the stomach, right, we have, this is where we can see its lining is an epithelium, okay, like I mentioned, providing support to that is going to be, uh, to, uh, providing support to the epithelium is going to be connective tissue, lining then the walls are going to be muscle tissue, 
And then as we mentioned, nervous tissue there as well. Now when we move from organ level to organ system level, here you can see various organs now come together to give rise to organ systems. So organ system level is where organs work together to accomplish a common purpose and it gives rise again to the organ system level which represents the sum of all structural levels working together. And then here moving to that uh, you can see full-on organismal level from organ system level. So all organ systems working together now. Now here, let's jump back and let's look at organ systems. Now when we look at organ systems, here we've got all these various organ systems that we're going to have sometimes multiple chapters dedicated to. And we'll go through them as the semester progresses. But here what your job will be is to go through each of these different organ systems and know the basics. Now when I say basics, it's going through and talking about what the organs are that make up the system and then talking about the functions. So I want you to go through each of them. You have integumentary system. For example, integumentary system, the organs, you can see the principal organs are going to include. You've got skin, you've got hair, nails, and then various glands. And when you talk about functions, you have to go through and you have to appreciate all the various functions and understand each of those functions there. So we've got integumentary system I want you to go through. Okay, you got those images, you got these images here as well. The skeletal system I want you to go through. Muscular system, nervous system, endocrine system, cardiovascular system. Right, that's what the note taker there is uh, for you to help you out with. So you have everything there. You can see if you're following along in the note taker how everything is listed there. And you've got basically the task of understanding all that, filling it out or doing whatever you got to do. So cardiovascular, again, organs and the functions. Lymphatic system, immunity, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and reproductive. So that'll be your task at hand to make sure you go through and get all of those uh, organ systems down. In relation to the organ system, I want you to know the organs making up each of the systems and then their functions. And then we're going to go through each of them and hit each of them in way greater detail as we progress chapter by chapter. Nice image here depicting how all the different organ systems come together and when they come together, how they will maintain homeostasis. Right, we talk homeostasis. Homeostasis, I want you to understand as well. It's the uh, act of basically maintaining a stable internal environment while the external is changing. So here food comes in. We absorb the nutrients and then we remove whatever we don't need. And here you can see how all the other organ systems are going to come together again to either bring things into the bloodstream or remove them from the bloodstream. Next thing, let's talk about the language of anatomy. When we talk about the language of anatomy, basically the roots of anatomical terminology are going to lie mainly from Latin and Greek terms, we'll see. So here first I'd like to talk to you guys about the anatomical position. Now, when we talk about the anatomical position, the anatomical position is going to be a standard body position. It is a standard body position. And in this position, you can see the patient will have their body erect, so they'll be standing, their body erect, their feet are slightly apart, about shoulder length apart, palms will be facing forward, and the thumbs face away from the body. This position is going to be a reference position. Now, this position is a reference position that we're going to use to describe different components in relation to our patient's bodies. 
So here in this position, we're going to use directional terms, and we're always going to use directional terms in relation to the body being in the anatomical position. Now, you got to remember the right and left. When you use right and left, that's referring to the body being viewed, not to your body. Okay, even though we're across from each other, my right is this side, right? It's opposite to yours. So you have to remember that when you're going to say the patient's right arm or the patient's right wrist or the patient's left elbow, you have to make sure it's the patient's, not your right elbow or your left elbow or, you know, what you may have there. Now here when we go through and we talk about... Um, this basically position, so again, right and left, refer to the sides of the person or the cadaver being viewed, not the right or the left of the observer. So again, standing, the erect, basically with feet flat, arms at the sides, they're supinated, we'll talk about what that is, and then palms facing uh, forward, face and eyes all facing forward. And again, it provides a constant reference of body position. Very important, very important. So here we can see some regional terms. These regional terms I want you to go through and understand as well. They'll allow you to understand the different regions, number one. So here you can see the anterior. And here we've got both anterior and posterior. So I want you to go through and understand each of these regional terms. Same thing they're showing you here, and then here as well. Next one we have basically some directional terms. Now when we talk directional terms, now here we've got directional terms, and they're frequently used basically to give reference to position of the body systems and structures. So here, first term I want you to be familiar with is going to be the term superior and the term inferior. Now, when we talk superior and inferior, superior is also known as cranial, so we can use the term cranial there as well, interchangeably, in relation to superior. Now, when we talk about something being superior, something being cranial, we're talking about it being found towards the head end. Excuse me. We're talking about it being found towards the head end or at the upper part of a structure or at the upper part of the body. So something that is above. The next term is inferior or you can say caudal. They're used interchangeably. Now when we're saying something is inferior caudal, we're saying that it is away from the head end or that it's going to be found towards the lower part of a structure or the lower part of the body or something that's found below something. Let's, you, uh, let's look at some examples here. Superior, if we compare the head to the torso, the head is superior compared to the torso. The torso is inferior or the abdomen we can say there, the head is superior compared to the abdomen and the abdomen we can say is inferior compared to the head or we can say now the navel is inferior to the chin or the chin is superior to the navel so you have to be able to use these terms and understand them or uh, apply them basically on the exam next then are the terms ventral and dorsal. Now we talk about something being ventral, we can say it's also, we can also use the term anterior there. So again, interchangeably. Ventral or anterior. Now we're saying something is ventral or anterior, we're talking about it being found towards or at the front of the body. <clears throat> towards or at the front of the body. Okay, or you could say it's in front of. It's ventral. It's in front of. The breastbone is anterior or ventral to the spine. So if we say dorsal or the term posterior, now we're talking about something being towards or at the back of the body, behind something. 
So here we could say the heart is posterior to the breastbone. Right? Or when we go to the beach, we're looking out for the dorsal fin. Right? Of a shark. The next terms I want you to be familiar with are going to be medial, lateral, and intermediate. Now, if we're talking about something being found medial, lateral, and intermediate, here we're going to see we're going to have basically a reference point. Now, the reference point is going to be an imaginary line at the midline of the body. Now, if we say something is medial, we're going to be referring to it as being found towards or at the midline of the body. For example, the heart is medial to the arm. Lateral means it's away from the midline of the body. The arms are lateral to the chest. One example there. Now the term intermediate now is going to be something in not too lateral, not too medial. So between a more medial and a more lateral structure. The collarbone is intermediate between the breastbone and the shoulder. What example they're giving us there. Right, we could say these veins, superficial veins, are intermediate, the skin and the muscles. Next time we have the terms proximal and distal. Now we're going to use these terms. <clears throat> I want you to know these terms are going to be used a couple of different ways now. So first, let's use the term proximal. If something is proximal, it's going to be found closer to the origin of the body part or the point of attachment of a limb to the body's trunk. So here, for example, now we'll use the upper limbs, right, the upper appendages, upper extremities, whatever you want to call them. So here we could say now the elbow, we can compare the elbow to the wrist. The elbow is more proximal to the wrist because that elbow is going to be found closer to the point of attachment of the limb to the body's trunk. The knee compared to the ankle, for example. The knee is more proximal. So the ankle is going to be distal. The wrist is going to be distal compared to that elbow. So we talk distal, distal, something that's distal is farther from the origin of a body part or farther from the point of attachment of the limb to the body trunk. The next term we have is superficial, or we can say external, and then deep or internal. Now we talk about something being superficial, it's going to be found towards or at the surface of the body. If it's deep or internal, it's away from the body surface. It's more internal. I hear they're giving us an example. The skin is superficial compared to our skeletal muscle. It makes absolute sense. And the lungs are deep compared to the skin. Absolutely correct. So, various directional terms. Okay, I want you to be familiar with. Now, regional terms we went through, I gave you some of those uh, there as well. Here we've got other regional terms I want you to be familiar with as well. Now, these regional terms are going to go through and look at basically two major divisions of the body. Now, these terms are axial and appendicular. Now, when we talk about the axial division, the axial part is going to be basically the part that makes up the main axis of our body. And now, it'll include the head, the neck, and the trunk, as we can see. Now, when we talk about the appendicular division, the appendicular division is going to consist of our appendages, or our limbs, which are attached or appended to the body's axis, or the body's axial skeleton.
So here we could see, we talk about the trunk. The trunk gets further subdivided into thoracic region and abdominal region. The abdominal region gets further subdivided into quadrants. And then also nine different regions. And we'll go through and we'll check all those out as well. So appendicular region gets divided up into the upper limb and lower limbs. Next then we have anatomical variability. Just like on the outside, we're all different. Same goes for the inside. 90% of all anatomical structures are going to match textbook descriptions. Okay, some say about 75, 90, so it's all in between there. Now when we talk nerves and blood vessels, they may be out of place. They're not going to be 100% exactly the same in every single one of us. Also some small muscles even may be missing in some of us. Extreme variations okay, are going to be inconsistent with life. Now we're just talking about a little bit of anatomical variability. Here we can see, normally speaking, how the kidneys are going to be found. Sometimes we can have what we call a pelvic kidney in patients. Sometimes they don't even know that they have this. They go in complaining of a stomach ache, you know, when they're 55 years of age and they discover they have a pelvic kidney. Same thing with horseshoe kidney. Now here we talk about the heart. Here we can see the usual distribution of the blood vessels that are exiting the heart. But sometimes we can have these other variations. Again, where everything is functioning perfectly fine, there's no problems. So anatomic variability. Next then let's talk body planes. Let's talk body planes. Now when we talk body planes and sections, we'll see body planes and sections are going to be used for anatomical studies. The body is often cut. Okay, So we'll see for anatomical studies, the body is often cut. And it's going to be cut, we'll see, along various, basically, surfaces that are called planes. So again, for anatomical studies, the body is often cut, or we can say it's sectioned along a flat surface called a plane. Most frequent body planes will include, we can see here, the sagittal plane. We can see there we also have frontal plane, and the third will be our transverse plane. So here we could go through and we can see basically divisions in relation, uh, descriptions in relation to each of them. And here we can see a nice image depicting to us how each of those three planes will look. So when we talk about a sagittal plane, a sagittal plane is going to be a vertical plane. It's a vertical plane which divides the body into right and left parts. To get more specific, we could use the term mid-sagittal plane or a median plane where now we're describing a sagittal plane exactly in the midline. Exactly in the midline, dividing the body into equal right and left parts now. Then third, we have a, or second subtype of sagittal plane is a parasagittal plane. So, when we talk now parasagittal, parasagittal, basically all other sagittal planes, making its way all the way to the back. Next, then we have the frontal plane. And we talk frontal plane or the coronal plane. It's a vertical plane. It's just like the sagittal plane. Okay, vertical plane, just like the sagittal plane. However, it's going to divide the body into anterior and posterior parts. It, dis it divides the body into anterior and posterior parts. So here you can see that frontal plane, how it divides the body into anterior and posterior parts. And then third is a transverse plane or a horizontal plane. 
Now, here you see this is not a vertical plane, so horizontal, and it divides the body into superior and inferior parts. So it'll divide the body into superior and inferior parts. We can also call it a cross-section, also called a cross-section, like uh, CAT scans are done in cross-sections. X-rays, X-rays along the frontal plane. And then MRIs we could see along mid sagittal or median sections. So we can appreciate the X-ray again along our frontal section. Same thing here. And then an MRI, cerebral angiogram. So here basically what's happened is we're using dye, filling the dye up into this vessel and then looking at it with an x-ray basically. And here's a PET scan. And then we have also ultrasonography. And then the same thing here we can see. All three planes of space. Very important you understand them. Same thing we've got here. Nice images, basically along the same planes. Let's talk then body cavities and membranes. Now we'll see there's two sets of internal body cavities that are closed to the environment and what they're going to do is they're going to provide different degrees of protection to the organs that are found within them. So first here we have what we call our dorsal body cavity and we have our ventral body cavity. Now this dorsal body cavity is what we'll talk about first. The dorsal body cavity it gets basically further subdivided. Now when you talk about its functions, its functions are going to include to protect the nervous system. So we talk subdivisions. Subdivisions include the cranial cavity and the vertebral cavity. The cranial cavity is going to encase the brain and encloses the brain, contains the brain you can say. The vertebral cavity is going to contain the spinal cord. So here you can see that very well. Same thing right inside of here. Cranial cavity and the vertebral cavity. The vertebral cavity runs within the bony vertebra and it encases the spinal cord. Now the second division, the ventral body cavity, you can see here the ventral body cavity, it houses our internal organs which collectively are called our viscera. And it's going to get divided into two by the diaphragm thanks to the diaphragm, biggest muscle of inspiration. You can see that there too. Next thing we have our thoracic cavity. So here you can appreciate the thoracic cavity from two different views. In this anterior view you can see that thoracic cavity is going to be subdivided. It gets subdivided into the two pleural cavities and then the mediastinum. The two pleural cavities will contain the lungs the mediastinum then, you can see, gets further subdivided into the superior mediastinum and then the pericardial cavity, which will contain the heart. Next then is the abdominal pelvic cavity. The abdominal pelvic cavity, it's going to contain the stomach, intestines, spleen, liver, right, and other organs. So make sure you've got those organs understood in the abdominal ca uh, cavity and then the pelvic cavity as well. The pelvic cavity is going to contain organs like the urinary bladder, okay, uh, prostate glands, some reproductive organs, and also the rectum. So thoracic cavity there as well, ventral body cavity. We'll talk about peritoneum inside of here as well. So here we can appreciate the quadrants I wanted you to go through. Here you have your four quadrants. 
right and left upper quadrants and then right and left lower quadrants. Here, very easy to understand the organs. Okay, so get those organs down and which quadrant they're at. But then here in the nine divisions, it's more specific. And eventually, you're going to have to know them from here. So I want you to go through and get these nine regions understood there as well. Right? Because if a patient is a male or female, now if they complain of the same area, now female parts being there sometimes can make the diagnosis a little bit uh, uh, more optional. Basically, you have more options to choose from. You know, Again, for example, if a male comes in complainting of uh, basically pain in the inguinal region or the lumbar region, in this left lumbar region, it could be, again, appendix. But if it's a female, we're going to think along with the appendix, some ovarian problems or fallopian tube situations there as well. So you can see the quantity of diagnoses there are going to have to increase. Same thing we can see here. All right, next let's talk about uh, body membranes. Now, the walls of the ventral body cavity and the outer surfaces of the organs are going to contain, or you can say they're covered by a thin, double-layered membrane that's called the serosa. The serosa, or you can refer to it also as the serous membrane, is a thin, double-layered membrane which lines the ventral body cavity and the outer surface of the organs in the cavity. So it's a thin double-layered membrane. Now the double layers will include the parietal serosa and the visceral serosa. The parietal serosa is the part of the membrane lining the cavity walls. So here now when we go through and we talk, parietal serosa, it's the layer that's going to be lining the cavity wall. So now if we're talking about the pericardial cavity, here we have parietal pericardium. Parietal pericardium is found lining the pericardial cavity. And if we're talking the pleural cavity, pleural cavity is going to have parietal pleura. So parietal pleura is going to be lining the walls of the thoracic cavity. And then third is parietal peritoneum. Parietal peritoneum is going to be associated with the walls of the abdominal pelvic cavity. With the walls of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Next, when we talk about the visceral layers, the visceral layers, okay, the visceral serosae, <coughs> excuse me, are going to be covering the organs in the cavity, actually covering the organs in the cavity. So, for example, we have visceral pericardium first. Visceral pericardium is going to be found covering the heart. Visceral pleura. Visceral pleura is going to be found covering the outside of the lungs. And then third, visceral peritonea. Visceral peritonea is going to be covering most of the organs within that uh, abdominal pelvic cavity. The outside of the organs within the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, between the parietal and the visceral serosae, you have serous fluid. The serous fluid is a lubricating fluid. It's a lubricating fluid that's secreted by both layers of the membrane, and it's going to fill that space. It fills the space separating the serous membrane from that visceral, basically, membrane. So it separates those serous membranes, separates the visceral membrane from the parietal membrane, more specifically speaking. So it separates the serous membranes from one another, the parietal and the visceral membrane from one another, and also allows them to rub up against one another whenever the heart contracts or whenever these uh, lungs are going to be expanding with air, and allows them to basically function basically friction-free, friction-free. So here we can get a better understanding of these uh, 
layers. You can think of these layers as basically if you were to get your fist and shove your fist into a balloon. So right when you put your fist into a balloon, right, the first layer you're going to touch right on top now, and you're going to keep pushing all the way inside. So the first layer you touch right on top is the layer that's directly on the organ. So that's going to be the visceral layer. So now here, when it comes all the way through, this layer out here is the parietal layer, the layer lining the cavity, we said. So here they could, you can see they're basically showing us that. Let me show you here. So here you can see they got their fist, shoved it inside the balloon. So this layer that's directly right on top of the balloon, that's the visceral serosa. And this layer out here is the parietal serosa. So if we look at the heart, right here, the two layers, we'll zoom in on there. You can see right inside of here, the visceral is the layer right on the organ, and then the parietal is right on the outside. We said lining the cavity. So same thing here with the lungs. Visceral pleura, right on top of the lungs. And then parietal pleura, you can see lining the cavity, lining the cavity. That's basically right inside of here. You can see there in greater detail. So then the ribs would all be here on the outside. Well, when you guys know if you make ribs, right, we tear that little, the casing off on the inside. That's basically this pleura right inside of there. And then here in the abdomen, you can appreciate the peritonea. So parietal, and the layer right on top, visceral. And then other body cavities that are exposed to the environment, we can see there. And then not exposed, we have synovial cavities along with the cavities that we mentioned.